Metzengerstein by Edgar Allan Poe. The families at Berlifitzing and Metzengerstein had been at variance for centuries. Never before were two houses, so illustrious, so mutually embittered by hostility so deadly. The origin of this enmity seems to be found in the words of an ancient prophecy, A lofty name shall have a fearful fall when, as the rider over his horse, the mortality of Metzengerstein shall triumph over the immortality of Berlifitzing. To be sure, the words themselves had little or no meaning, but more trivial causes have given rise, and that no long ago, to consequences equally eventful. Besides the estates, which were contiguous, had long exercised a rival influence in the affairs of a busy government. Moreover, near neighbors are seldom friends, and the inhabitants of the castle Berlifitzing might look from their lofty buttresses into the very windows of the palace Metzengerstein. Least of all had the more than feudal magnificence thus discovered a tendency to allay the irritable feelings of the less ancient and less wealthy Berlifitzing. What wonder, then, that the words, however silly, of that prediction should have succeeded in setting and keeping at variance two families already predisposed to quarrel by every instigation of hereditary jealousy. The prophecy seemed to imply, if it implied anything, a final triumph on the part of the already more powerful house, and was, of course, remembered with the more bitter animosity by the weaker and less influential. Wilhelm, Count Berlifitzing, although loftily descended, was at the epoch of this narrative an infirm and doting old man, remarkable for nothing but an inordinate and inveterate personal antipathy to the family of his rival, and so passionate a love of horses and of hunting that neither bodily infirmity, great age, nor mental incapacity prevented his daily participation in the dangers of the chase. Frederick, Baron Metzengerstein, was on the other hand not yet of age. His father, the minister G., died young. His mother, the lady Mary, followed him quickly. Frederick was at that time in his eighteenth year. In a city, eighteen years is no long period, but in a wilderness, in so magnificent a wilderness as that old principality, the pendulum vibrates with deeper meaning. From some peculiar circumstances attending the administration of his father, the Baron Metzengerstein, after his father's decease, entered immediately upon his vast possessions. Such estates were seldom before held by a nobleman of Hungary. His castles were without number. The chief in point of splendor and extent was the palace Metzengerstein. The boundary line of his dominion was never clearly defined, but his principal park embraced a circuit of fifty miles. Upon the succession of a proprietor so young and with a character so well known to a fortune so unparalleled, little speculation was afloat in regard to his probable course of conduct. And, indeed, for the space of three days, the behavior of the heir outherited Herod, and fairly surpassed the expectations of his most enthusiastic admirers. Shameful debaucheries, flagrant treacheries, unheard of atrocities, gave his trembling vassals quickly to understand that no servile submission on their part, no punctilios of conscience on his own, were thenceforward to prove any security against the remorseless fangs of a petty Caligula. On the night of the fourth day, the stables of the castle Berlifitzing were discovered to be on fire, and the unanimous opinion of the neighborhood added the crime of the incendiary to the already hideous list of the baron's misdemeanors and enormities. But during the tumult occasioned by this occurrence, the young nobleman himself sat apparently buried in meditation in a vast and desolate upper apartment of the family palace of Metzengerstein. The rich, although faded, tapestry hangings which swung gloomily upon the walls represented the shadowy and majestic forms of a thousand illustrious ancestors. Here, rich, ermine priests and pontifical dignitaries, familiarly seated with the autocrat and the sovereign, put a veto on the wishes of a temporal king, or restrained with the fiat of papal supremacy, the rebellious scepter of the archenemy. There, the dark, tall statures of the princes Metzengerstein, their muscular war-coursers plunging over the carcasses of fallen foes startled the steadiest nerves with their vigorous expression, while here, again, 
The voluptuous and swan-like figures of the dames of days gone by floated away in the mazes of an unreal dance to the strains of imaginary melody. But as the baron listened, or affected to listen, to the gradually increasing uproar in the stables of Berlifitzing, or perhaps pondered upon some more novel, some more decided act of audacity, his eyes were turned unwittingly to the figure of an enormous and unnaturally colored horse, represented in the tapestry as belonging to a Saracen ancestor of the family of his rival. The horse itself in the foreground of the design stood motionless and statue-like, while farther back its discomfited rider perished by the dagger of a Metzengerstein. On Frederick's lip arose a fiendish expression as he became aware of the direction which his glance had, without his consciousness, assumed. Yet he did not remove it. On the contrary, he could by no means account for the overwhelming anxiety which appeared to be falling like a pall upon his senses. It was with difficulty that he reconciled his dreamy and incoherent feelings with the certainty of being awake. The longer he gazed, the more absorbing became the spell. The more impossible did it appear that he could ever withdraw his glance from the fascination of that tapestry. But the tumult, without becoming suddenly more violent, with a compulsory exertion, he diverted his attention to the glare of ruddy light thrown fully by the flaming stables upon the windows of the apartment. The action, however, was but momentary. His gaze returned mechanically to the wall. To his extreme horror and astonishment, the head of the gigantic steed had in the meantime altered its position. The neck of the animal, before arched, as if in compassion over the prostrate body of its lord, was now extended at full length in the direction of the baron. The eyes, before invisible, now wore an energetic and human expression, while they gleamed with a fiery and unusual red and the distended lips of the apparently enraged horse left in full view his sepulchral and disgusting teeth. Stupefied with terror, the young nobleman tottered to the door. As he threw it open, a flash of red light streaming far into the chamber flung his shadow with a clear outline against the quivering tapestry, and he shuddered to perceive that shadow as he staggered a while upon the threshold, assuming the exact position and precisely filling up the contour of the relentless and triumphant murderer of the Saracen Berlifitzing. To lighten the depression of his spirits, the baron hurried into the open air. At the principal gate of the palace he encountered three equerries. With much difficulty and at the imminent peril of their lives, they were restraining the convulsive plunges of a gigantic and fiery-colored horse. Whose horse? Where did you get him? demanded the youth in a querulous and husky tone, as he became instantly aware that the mysterious steed in the tapestried chamber was the very counterpart of the furious animal before his eyes. "'He is your own property, sire,' replied one of the equerries. "'At least he is claimed by no other owner. We caught him flying, all smoking and foaming with rage from the burning stables of the castle Berlifitzing, Supposing him to have belonged to the old count's stud of foreign horses, uh, he led him back as an estray.' but the grooms there disclaim any title to the creature, which is strange since he bears evident marks of having made a narrow escape from the flames. The letters WVB are also branded very distinctly on his forehead, interrupted a second equerry. I suppose them, of course, to be the initials of William von Berlifitzing, but all at the castle are positive and denying any knowledge of the horse. "'Extremely singular,' said the young baron, with a musing air, and apparently unconscious of the meaning of his words. "'He is, as you say, a remarkable horse, a, a prodigious horse, although, as you justly observe, of a suspicious and untraceable character. L "'Let him be mine, however,' he added after a pause. "'Perhaps a rider like Frederick of Metzengerstein may tame even the devil from the stables of Berlifitzing.' You are mistaken, my lord. The horse, as I think we mentioned, is not from the stables of the Count. If such had been the case, we know our duty better than to bring him into the presence of a noble of your family. True, observed the baron dryly. At that instant, a page of the bedchamber came from the palace with a heightened color and a precipitate step. He whispered into his master's ear a strange account of the sudden disappearance of a small portion of the tapestry in an apartment which he designated, entering at the same time into particulars of a minute and circumstantial character, 
but from the low tone of voice in which these details communicated, nothing escaped to gratify the excited curiosity of the equerries. During the conference, the young Frederick seemed agitated by a variety of emotions. He soon, however, recovered his composure, and an expression of determined malignancy settled upon his countenance as he gave peremptory orders that the apartment in question should be immediately locked up and the key placed in his own possession. "'Have you heard of the unhappy death of the old hunter, Berlifitzing?' said one of his vassals to the baron, as, after the departure of the page, the huge steed which that nobleman had adopted as his own plunged and curveted with redoubled fury down the long avenue which extended from the palace to the stables of Metzengerstein. "'No,' said the baron, turning abruptly toward the speaker. "'Dead, say you?' "'It is indeed true, my lord, and to the noble of your name it is, I imagine, no unwelcome intelligence.' A rapid smile shot over the countenance of the listener. "'How died he?' In his rash exertions to rescue a favorite portion of the hunting stud, he has himself perished miserably in the flames. Indeed, ejaculated the baron, as if slowly and deliberately impressed with the truth of some exciting idea. Indeed, repeated the vassal. Shocking, said the youth calmly, and turned quietly into the palace. From this date a marked alteration took place in the outward demeanor of the dissolute young Baron Frederick von Metzengerstein. Indeed, his behavior disappointed every expectation and proved little in accordance with the views of many a maneuvering mamma, while his habits and manner were, if anything, even less congenial than formerly with those of the neighboring aristocracy. He was never to be seen beyond the limits of his own domain, and in his wide and socially limitless world was utterly companionless, unless, indeed, that unnatural, impetuous, and fiery-colored horse which he henceforward continually bestrode had any mysterious right to the title of his friend. Numerous invitations on the part of the neighborhood for a long time, however, periodically came in. Will the baron honor our festivals with his presence? Will the baron join us in a hunting of the boar? Metzengerstein does not hunt. Metzengerstein will not attend were the haughty and laconic answers. These repeated insults were not to be endured by an imperious nobility. Such invitations became less cordial, less frequent. In time they ceased altogether. The widow of the unfortunate Count Berlifitzing was even heard to express a hope that the baron might be at home when he did not wish to be at home, since he disdained the company of his equals, and ride when he did not wish to ride, since he preferred the society of a horse. This, to be sure, was a very silly explosion of hereditary pique, and merely proved how singularly unmeaning our sayings are apt to become when we desire to be unusually energetic. The charitable, nevertheless, attributed the alteration in the conduct of the young nobleman to the natural sorrow of a son for the untimely loss of his parents, forgetting, however, his atrocious and reckless behavior during the short period immediately succeeding that bereavement. Some there were, indeed, who suggested a too haughty idea of self-consequence and dignity. Others, again, among whom may be mentioned the family physician, did not hesitate in speaking of morbid melancholy and hereditary ill health, while dark hints of a more equivocal nature were current among the multitude. Indeed, the baron's perverse attachment to his lately acquired charger, an attachment which seemed to attain new strength from every fresh example of the animal's ferocious and demon-like propensities, at length became, in the eyes of all reasonable men, a hideous and unnatural fervor. In the glare of noon, at the dead hour of night, in sickness or in health, in calm or in tempest, the young Metzengerstein seemed riveted to the saddle of that colossal horse, whose intractable audacity so well accorded with his own spirit. There were circumstances, moreover, which, coupled with late events, gave an unearthly and portentous character to the mania of the rider and to the capabilities of the steed. The space passed over in a single leap had been accurately measured and was found to exceed, by an astounding difference, the wildest expectations of the most imaginative. The baron, besides, had no particular name for the animal, although... All the rest in his collection were distinguished by characteristic appellations. This horse's stable, too, was appointed at a distance from the rest, and with regard to grooming and other necessary offices. None but the owner in person had ventured to officiate, or even to enter the enclosure of that horse's particular stall. 
It was also to be observed that although the three grooms who had caught the steed as he fled from the conflagration at Berlifitzing had succeeded in arresting his course by means of a chain bridle and noose, yet not one of the three could with any certainty affirm that he had, during that dangerous struggle, or at any period thereafter, actually placed his hand upon the body of the beast. Instances of peculiar intelligence in the demeanor of a noble and high-spirited horse are not to be supposed capable of exciting unreasonable attention, but there were certain circumstances which intruded themselves perforce upon the most skeptical and phlegmatic. It is said that there were times when the animal caused the gaping crowd who stood around to recoil in horror from the deep and impressive meaning of his terrible stamp, times when the young Metzengerstein turned pale and shrunk away from the rapid and searching expression of his human-looking eye. Among all the retinue of the baron, however, none were found to doubt the ardor of that extraordinary affection which existed on the part of the young nobleman for the fiery qualities of his horse. At least, none but an insignificant and misshapen little page whose deformities were in everybody's way, and whose opinions were of the least possible importance. He, if his ideas are worth mentioning at all, had the effrontery to assert that his master never vaulted into the saddle without an unaccountable and almost imperceptible shudder, and that, upon his return from every long, continued, and habitual ride, an expression of triumphant malignity distorted every muscle in his countenance. One tempestuous night, Metzengerstein, awaking from a heavy slumber, descended like a maniac from his chamber, and, mounting in hot haste, bounded away into the mazes of the forest. An occurrence so common attracted no particular attention, but his return was looked for with intense anxiety on the part of his domestics when, after some hours' absence, the stupendous and magnificent battlements of the palace Metzengerstein were discovered crackling and rocking to their very foundation, under the influence of a dense and livid mass of ungovernable fire. As the flames, when first seen, had already made so terrible a progress that all efforts to save any portion of the building were evidently futile, the astonished neighborhood stood idly around in silent, if not pathetic, wonder. But a new and fearful object soon riveted the attention of the multitude and proved how much more intense is the excitement wrought in the feelings of a crowd by the contemplation of human agony than that brought about by the most appalling spectacles of inanimate matter. Up the long avenue of aged oaks, which led from the forest to the main entrance of the palace Metzengerstein, a steed, bearing an unbonneted and disordered rider, was seen leaping with an impetuosity which outstripped the very demon of the tempest. The career of the horseman was indisputably, on his own part, uncontrollable. The agony of his countenance, the convulsive struggle of his frame, gave evidence of superhuman exertion, but no sound, save a solitary shriek, escaped from his lacerated lips, which were bitten through and through in the intensity of terror. One instant, and the clattering of hooves resounded sharply and shrilly above the roaring of the flames and the shrieking of the winds. Another, and clearing at a single plunge the gateway in the moat, the steed bounded far up the tottering staircases of the palace, and, with its rider, disappeared amid the whirlwind of chaotic fire. The fury of the tempest immediately died away, and a dead calm sullenly succeeded. A white flame still enveloped the building like a shroud, and, streaming far away into the quiet atmosphere, shot forth a glare of preternatural light, while a cloud of smoke settled heavily over the battlements in the distinct colossal figure of a horse.'